Hello, I'm going to talk to you now about um, possible topics for section C of next week's paper two. So this is the 71272, which is due next Thursday, the 16th of June in the afternoon, unless you have a clash with business or psychology, or maybe both, in which case you'll be doing it at an alternative time, potentially. But uh, anyway, I have no advanced information other than what's been given to us by the exam board. I haven't seen the paper, um, so I am just taking an educated guess so please don't sue me um, if I get it wrong. Um, so advanced information just to remind you from AQA they've told us that for paper 2 section B we can expect marginal costing and we can expect standard costing and variance analysis and I've already recorded some videos I'll be doing some more on those topics very soon. Um, so I'm just concentrating now on section C um, where they've told us the questions will involve absorption and activity-based costing and capital investment appraisal. So what could they ask us about? So the $10 million question, what might actually come up? I think a distinct possibility is a bit of a, a hybrid of the Renner PLC question, which was from 2019. I have recorded a separate video on that. Um, and the Ekin PLC question, which was one on activity-based costing. Um, and there are there's another video on that as well. So I'm going through both of those in considerable detail. Um, so maybe there'll be a situation in this exam where the company is currently using absorption costing, but it's not using the most appropriate basis for apportionment. So overheads are not being apportioned or shared fairly between different products or different departments. So you could be asked to calculate overhead absorption rates, but I, I don't think they'll go into that level of detail, but who knows. Um, in the Renner question, they were um, apportioning overheads between three departments, but they were using floor area for everything. So um, floor area is appropriate if it's anything to do with the buildings. So if it's rent, business rates, maybe insurance, premise, you know, property insurance, um, heat and light, then floor area is fine. But for things like depreciation, you should be thinking about machinery um, value or netbook value or the original cost um, when it comes to apportioning that. Um, if it's supervisor salaries or canteen costs, then um, you know the number of employees in each department would be a far more sensible way to go about it. Just a reminder that when we are apportioning overheads, we never use machine hours and we never use labour hours. Those are not potential basis for um, you know, apport overhead apportionment, they are used to calculate an overhead absorption rate. So um, I'll, I'll do some a separate video on that, but uh, just a reminder there. So it might be that you need to advise them how activity-based costing could provide a fairer way to share the overhead. So I'd be looking for things like, you know, is there any, any information about the batch sizes that these products are produced in? Because as we know, batch size does affect um, how efficient our workforce is. So if there are machine setups that are required with every batch, or quality control inspections that are required with every batch, then making things in a larger batch will spread that overhead cost over more units. So it will become cheaper per unit in terms of cost. So as I said, have a look at my Ekin PLC video. Um, and I think there are one or two others as well. So um, give you an idea about how activity-based costing works in detail. They could give you, as I said, so some clues in the information. That's what we're going to be looking for. Um, so I just talked about that one there so um, as I said work through the Ekin question and you can see there how that affects the way overheads attributed to output. Um, so just a reminder here about the Renner question um, they gave us a load of information three departments it could just as easily be some products that are made different product lines um, and they told us about the contribution and the overheads and uh, we weren't asked to do anything about reapportioning the overheads but when we actually looked um, at the figures um, the profit or loss for each department um, was you know, using those overheads the way that they'd been allocated and apportioned between the departments. It meant that department two was incurring a loss. Um, so I'm not going to go through this now because I've just done that with, um, with a separate video on Renner PLC. Um, but you kind of get the idea. So the way these overheads have been shared out, that could be partially responsible for that loss in department two. So if we used activity-based costing or indeed if we just apportioned the overheads on a fairer basis rather than just chucking everything in there on the basis of floor area, it could give a very different result. It might be that you know department two makes a small profit and department three ends up making a loss. Um, but the things to remember are that overheads don't just disappear. So even if we were to shut this department down, our overheads wouldn't just vanish. They're overheads that are common to the organization. So things like rent, 
um, supervisors' salaries are unlikely to, to reduce to any great extent just because we close a department down. The only thing we might lose is perhaps some depreciation um, if we were to get rid of some of the machinery from the, the department that's been closed down. Okay, so um, yeah, there's lots of stuff here. If we looked at the mark scheme, um, it told us there that floor area is not the best basis to apportion overheads for all costs, and so the profit for each department may not be correct. So for example, machinery depreciation would be better apportioned on cost of machinery and supervisors' salaries will be better apportioned based on the number of employees that they're supervising in each department. Um, also, they're saying that it might be better to base a decision on marginal costing because the overheads will need to be paid regardless of which departments are kept open or closed. And that's a more usual scenario. If you look up decision making you know, in your accounting textbooks, you will see there that that is largely based on marginal costing. So, you know, whether we should close a loss making department down, whether we should make or buy, um, you know, whether we should accept extra work it's all based on the contribution because we recognise that the overheads, unless they are stepped at a particular level of output, don't tend to change in line with output. They don't reduce if we reduce output and they don't increase um, significantly if we increase output. Um, so, and then again, it says, you know, what I said about the uh, business using activity based costing, which should give a more accurate, a fairer way of, of sharing the overheads. It's based on cost pools and cost drivers. Um, and also asking about whether there's any interdependency between the products. So, are they complementary to one another? Is it therefore not practical to close a department? If you've got one department making shaver handles and the other one making the blades, you know, you can't sell one without the other. Capital investment appraisal is the other topic they've already warned us about um, that's going to come up. Now, capital investment appraisal is a fairly standard topic. Um, there's not really a great deal of, of variation. There, there never has been. If you look back at all the questions on under the current specification and under the previous specification, the old ACCN4 exams, um, nothing much has really changed over the years. Um, you do need to have the basic skills. You need to be able to ascertain cash flows. So remembering things like never put depreciation in a cash flow. So when we're trying to calculate the net present value and the payback, it's dependent on cash flows. Um, so, you know, it might be that they've given you some figures, some profit figures um, for a number of years, but that includes depreciation. So you're going to need to add that back to the profit to come up with the cash effect. So just watch out for that one. You need to be confident in calculating net present value um, and payback period. And I'll be recording videos on uh, just reminding you on how to do that. Um, check out the following questions. So I've done a video on APLC, um, question 16, section C from 2021. That was a full capital investment appraisal question. Um, you've got SAB, which was a section A question. So some basic calculations on net present value, NPV, and payback period. Um, so as I said, I've recorded separate step-by-step -step videos for both of those, and I'll put the links um, in the notes or a, a link at the end of the video. Um, have a look back at the old ACCN4 papers. Um, so, you know, pretty much most of the sittings of ACCN4 would have had investment appraisal in some form or other. So that is quite useful. Um, the questions tended to be probably heavier on the calculations and they're expecting you to, you know, to produce in, uh, in section C of the new specification. Um, but the writing, they were much happier with you just producing things in bullet points. Um, so, you know, it'll give you an idea, but don't use those the written parts of those as a model. Okay, so I think that's pretty much all I can say about that. Um, hopefully that's given you a little bit of guidance, but as I said, please don't sue me um, if I get it wrong. Thanks very much for watching. Remember to, to like the video if you liked it and subscribe if you want notification of uh, upcoming videos. Thanks very much for watching.